Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Simone Atkinson with Get to the Point Nursing Notes and today we are covering pulmonary embolism. Let's get to the point. So let's begin by understanding that an embolus, which typically originates from deep vein thrombosis or DVT, it goes through the right side of the heart and lodges within a branch of the pulmonary artery. So this lodging will abruptly stop the flow of blood, leading to a condition where ventilation and blood circulation become imbalanced. And this imbalance is termed ventilation perfusion mismatch. Now this mismatch in simple terms involves a notable difference between the volume of air and the volume of blood circulating in the affected lung region. And consequently, this disruption leads to compromised gas exchange. So one primary risk factor we encounter is immobility. Patients with restricted movement, such as those bedridden or immobilized after surgery, they're at an elevated risk. And another key factor is hypocoagulability. This refers to reduced blood clotting ability, and this can promote clot formation potentially leading to embolism. So endothelial damage, particularly affecting the inner lining of blood vessel, they play a vital role in creating an environment conducive to these blood clot developments. And lastly, we have long bone fractures, which can give rise to fat emboli, and these emboli can travel through the bloodstream and contribute to the risk of pulmonary embolism. So when the obstruction within the pulmonary artery becomes substantial, it can lead to a condition known as a pulmonary infarction. So this pulmonary infarction involves the death of the lung tissue because of the inadequate blood supply that's caused by the embolic blockage. And this occurrence obviously seriously impacts overall lung function and it interferes with the exchange of gases. There is severe impairment of gas exchange that can rapidly escalate to a life-threatening scenario for this client and the disruption in oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange can lead to hypoxemia and subsequently organ dysfunction. So the role as healthcare professionals is crucial in that we recognize and address these potential outcomes promptly. So during our evaluation, we need to carefully consider a range of indicators. So first observe for restlessness, anxiety, agitation, and apprehension in the client which can signify a heightened distress. Vital signs, be attentive to signs of tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, as well as the possibility of a low-grade fever. Respiratory symptoms play a significant role, including the presence of shortness of breath or dyspnea and chest pain, and this is often reflective of a compromised lung function. So we need to be vigilant about the signs of cough and potential hemoptysis, as these could also indicate a pulmonary embolism. Neurological changes are a vital uh, item to also monitor, particularly any shifts in mental status of potential decreases in consciousness that may arise. And when it comes to the skin, keep an eye out for a possible diaphoresis, which could progress to pallor and even cyanosis and this is highlighting the oxygenation concerns. So a patient's relevant history is also crucial. Be sure to inquire about recent instances of thromboembolism or long bone fractures. When auscultating, listen carefully for lung crackles, which could be an important indicator of a pulmonary embolism as well. And finally, consider cardiac auscultation findings, include any detection of an S3 or S4 gallop, this could be linked to atrial fibrillation, which has the potential to result in mural thrombi that are originating from the right atrium and becoming a source of pulmonary embolism. So beginning with a chest x-ray, it might present as normal or show signs of pulmonary infiltration. And a pulmonary angiogram will play a vital role. It'll pinpoint the specific location of the pulmonary embolism. A ventilation perfusion scan, this provides valuable insights and it reveals the areas where ventilation and blood flow are mismatched. And an arterial blood gas analysis is also crucial. It can help detect low PO2 levels, which indicates compromised oxygenation. 
Let's start by discussing the initial steps in managing a client with pulmonary embolism. One of the first actions is to remain with the, the client. Provide a continuous presence that offers reassurance and the immediate addressing of any pressing needs of the client. Elevate the head of the bed. That's an important maneuver as it optimizes the client's blood circulation and it enhances their oxygenation levels. Supplemental oxygen plays a vital role, enhancing respiratory support and oxygen saturation levels. So this therapy should be administered as prescribed or according to established protocols. Now in monitoring efforts, we need to pay close attention to vital signs and vigilantly monitor lung sounds. This, this approach enables us to promptly detect any potential complications or changes in the client's condition. Maintain intravenous access is essential. This access will allow us to swiftly administer any vital medications and fluids that are going to be required for the client stabilization. And then in situations with hemodynamic stability, if it's compromised, we want to provide circulatory support as an essential intervention. And this can involve various measures to ensure that the client's cardiovascular stability is enhanced. So our role also extends to the client and the family education. Clear, comprehensive explanations of any procedure and therapies that are being implemented will foster an understanding and a cooperation of the client and family. This in turn will also enhance the overall client experience. From medical guidelines, we want to initiate anticoagulant or thrombolytic therapy to address the root cause of the embolism. Ensure your client's comfort. We also administer appropriate opioid analgesics and anti-anxiety agents. In some cases, surgical options may be considered. They may include an embolectomy or the insertion of a vena cava filter. So these interventions effectively manage the condition and prevent further complications. So ultimately, managing pulmonary embolism requires a collaborative approach. The approach underscores the detection and the dedication and the work of the team that's required to provide comprehensive, effective care to these clients in this condition. So to wrap things up, empower the clients with essential knowledge and actions. First and foremost, we focus on the prevention of thromboembolism. Have them take proactive measures. Stress the importance of reducing immobility whenever it's possible. Educate our clients on how to recognize the early signs and symptoms of venous occlusion. Clients need to seek timely intervention. It's crucial for positive outcomes. And last but not least, effective communication is key. We need to provide clear instructions to both the client and their family regarding the purpose and the proper management of anticoagulant therapy. Okay, you are all set with the most important points of pulmonary embolism to care for these clients. If you found the information helpful, subscribe, like, share, watch the other videos, share these videos with other nursing students. We will see you in the next video.